As many of you uh, hopefully know, Ryan Fajardo is my name. It wasn't too long that I was sitting in your shoes. It certainly is a pleasure to be back. Thanks to Scott for inviting me back. As you can see uh, in this slide, I'm now at Michigan State University in the, uh, the land of eternal winter, as I've discovered. And my first visit back, the, uh, the visitor center was not as painful as I thought it would be. Uh, we're going to have to press to get through uh, this in 30 minutes, so I'm just going to launch right into it. It's perhaps relevant. We're beginning uh, the first major organ system talk with the shoulder. Of all the exams you may be asked to do, the shoulder is one of those that's increasing in relevance. And certainly if uh, you're in a place like Europe where cost efficiency uh, is becoming uh, very important, you do a lot of shoulder ultrasound. First, I'd like to give some credit to my uh, uh, sonographer. I do have one. It's been a great uh, experience, but the sole proprietor of Great Lakes Musculoskeletal Ultrasound is Veronica Rodriguez. She played a role in uh, obtaining most of the images that I have to show you today. Uh, the outline for the talk will include a few brief overview points, then we'll go into uh, technique. We'll spend a lot of time looking at normal sonographic anatomy and all the components of the exam. A notable exception here is the uh, pectoralis major tendon, despite some great images that I had and provided by Scott Campbell. There just is not time. We can go over the pec major at the, uh, uh, in the hands-on portion of the course. We'll then also look at some relevant pathology. So first, an overview. Why really bother with this whole ultrasound business? We have MRI, and that's a pretty good study. And the bottom line is that ultrasound uh, is a good test. In fact, uh, recent data obtained with modern high-frequency transducers, this was published uh, at the University of Michigan by John Jacobson as, uh, as of 2009. You can see that with regard to the rotator cuff, ultrasound is at least as good, if not better. In fact, I would make an argument it's probably better than MRI uh, in both sensitivity and specificity. And in large part, this has to do with our ability to image dynamically as well as the improved space resolution with these modern transducers. That space resolution is better than uh, can be obtained with MR. Indeed, also ultrasound is cheap, at least it's cheaper. Uh, I realize you guys uh, are a little sheltered from reimbursements, but this does play a, a big role in the real world. Now, just to show you the professional fee, currently, uh, as of 2011, the professional fee for ultrasound is a little more than half now uh, of an MRI. Uh, certainly, the technical fees remain disparate, uh, but that's largely due to the greater capital investment required to get yourself involved with, uh, with MR. And certainly, there's great questions as the effect of future reimbursement cuts. MRI tends to take the brunt of those, and who knows, maybe ultrasound becomes the Cadillac for imaging the shoulder uh, later on. Indeed, some patients just can't have an MRI, and this list is not inclusive, but we've got absolute and relative contraindications that may preclude them from having that exam. Uh, and indeed, uh, something that I experience to a great degree is, uh, is competition, and I realize that that's also something that we're relatively sheltered from here, but the bottom line is that radiologists have always had a precarious position not having control of patients. It's always been my feeling that we should do what we have and do it well. Uh, the, the bottom line is when you decrease equipment size, you make it uh, uh, more affordable, you decrease its cost, you improve its quali quality relative to MRI specifically for the rotator cuff. And then you start squeezing non-radiologist providers, which, you know, it's reimbursement cuts affect them as much as us. Uh, other individuals become interested, and I'm sure you're aware that, uh, you know, rheumatology here, for instance, is doing a lot of musculoskeletal ultrasound. Certainly there are other interested parties. The bottom line is, I think, engage your clinicians, do a study that uh, you're asked to do, and do it as well as you can. There are some downsides with shoulder ultrasound. Certainly it is a time-consuming study based on those reimbursement figures I showed you. You have to do roughly two times the number of ultrasounds for every MR to be cost effective, that really only becomes feasible when you have a dedicated technologist. Uh, it is user dependent. Certainly the accuracy is related to experience and training. Uh, there are some limitations, uh, as you see here, articular cartilage, uh, the intraarticular biceps tendon, labral tears, uh, subcortical osseous disease, and in the neighborhood lesions that might result in referred pain that may be included in the field of view on MR, you might not see on ultrasound. Uh, you know, what's the overall outlook? The bottom line is it's a great study specifically for rotator cuff tears. It's very cost effective. And, you know, and in my opinion, people that are uh, skilled in cross-sectional imaging anatomy probably are the ones uh, that are best suited to do the exam. That's my opinion. Uh, it certainly should be something I think that you're able to perform. Uh, so the bigger picture with regard to technique as we go into the exam here is just to bear in mind that we're attempting to identify uh, anatomy in acoustic windows. Okay, there are a few acoustic impediments to us at the shoulder. And they are the clavicle, the acromion, and the, um, uh, the coracoid process. So fortunately, the rotator cuff tendons are attached onto a mobile structure, the humeral head. Okay, and we're going to use our knowledge of anatomy and manipulate the humeral head to position the rotator cuff tendons we want to see uh, in spaces between those acoustic impediments. And this will become clear as we move through the talk here. So let's go on to the sonographic evaluation. We'll start with the acromioclavicular joint. So this uh, drawing here, I've stenciled in those acoustic impediments. This is uh, my son, and trust me, non-toxic ink was utilized. No children were harmed in the making of this PowerPoint. But uh, you can see the clavicle, acromion, and coracoid process is roughly their position on the patient. Unfortunately, my son is very thin. They're easier to find. 
Um, we're going to start uh, examining the acromioclavicular joint by placing our probe uh, in a dorsal orientation thusly. Okay, our representative image will look something like this, uh, where you recognize normal and smooth margins of both the clavicle and the acromion and a relative uniform thickness uh, and also uniform in echogenicity dorsal acromioclavicular joint capsule. Now, throughout the course, I'm going to show you representative images, but recognize that real time what you're doing is you're trying to image the entirety of the AC joint. Okay, you're sweeping your probe posterior and anterior. Okay, one of the powers of, uh, of ultrasound, obviously, is our ability to image dynamically. Okay, and one of the things you can do is to do a cross-shoulder adduction test, uh, referred to as the scarf test by sonographers. This simply implies having the patient grab their contralateral shoulder while you're watching. I, what you're looking for is movement at the acromioclavicular joint, okay, asymmetric widening, narrowing, or offset, which may imply some instability. But certainly, and, and perhaps more importantly, our ability to assess impingement is something that can't be done with MR, but you can do it quite well uh, with ultrasound. So if we place our probe at the lateral margin of the acromion in a static position, uh, we'll obtain an image that looks something like this. And you can see the shadowing of chromium. Uh, there is the supraspinatus tendon in this case uh, inserting onto its foot plate at the humeral head. We can also identify other anatomy. Uh, in red here, you see the deltoid, the lateral deltoid fibers in this case. Uh, indeed, the decompressed normal subacromial subdeltoid bursal tissue. Uh, in fact, uh, I didn't point this out, but here is some articular cartilage at the humeral head, which has a characteristic uh, iso to slightly hypoechoic fibrillar appearance. So what we're going to do is, we're, while we're watching with the probe in that position, we're going to have the patient abduct uh, their arm. So probe remains stationary, patient abducts their arm, and what we're looking to see is smooth sliding of bursal tissue and rotator cuff underneath the acromion. Okay, so you'll notice in this case, all we've got is echogenic humeral head and acromion. I didn't show you the video uh, due to some difficulties, but the bottom line is you want to make sure that there is no hang-up of bursal tissue or rotator cuff tissue. It does, you want to make sure it doesn't catch on the acromion. Certainly, if uh, you do see some catching of that tissue and some pain, you would have diagnosed uh, primary impingement uh, in that case. Again, something that really can't be done well with MRI. So moving our attention to the biceps tendon, we're going to begin by looking for its myotendinous junction. And in general, your orientation for the probe will be parallel to your humeral shaft. So placing the probe roughly in this position, we would expect to find uh, an image that looks something like this. Uh, in red, you see the myotendinous junction of the biceps tendon with some overlying deltoid tissue. And nearly what we're going to do, and certainly I think if it's easier for you to identify the tendon first, you can begin in a higher uh, orientation as shown uh, by probe position here. And here you see a more recognizable biceps tendon. Uh, now, we had a fantastic lecture on ultrasound physics. I'll just emphasize that tendons really in all areas of the body image uh, in an identical fashion. Okay, They should be relatively uniform in thickness, and they have a characteristic uh, collagen architecture. Okay, Densely ordered bundles of collagen will image to us as alternating bands of increased and decreased echogenicity subject to anisotropy. Okay, So recognize here that even though we have a little pseudo-thickening of that tendon as it enters the peripheral rotator interval, Okay, so that's uh, up here. The tendon is otherwise uniform in thickness and uniform in its echogenicity. So uh, to attempt to uh, image the interarticular segment of the, uh, the, uh, the portion of the biceps tendon in the peripheral rotator interval, we're going to angle our probe towards the superior glenoid. And you may find it helpful to actually have a little anterior rotation of the humeral head. Okay, that is, if you just have to move their elbow back a little bit, this will rotate this portion of the biceps tendon forward for you. But essentially, your job is you know where the superior glenoid is located, aim your probe towards it, you might get a representative image that looks something like this. Now, again, due to anisotropy, we've got an oblique orientation of the course of the biceps tendon. This is challenging to see. It's often hypoechoic. Here in red, denoted by my uh, technologists and calipers there, you can see the interarticular segment to its insertion on the superior glenoid. Uh, I think in my hands, I find this quite challenging to obtain, but she routinely gets pretty good images uh, of the biceps tendon. So our short axis views of the biceps will be obtained by rotating our probe 90 degrees to that shown for long axis imaging. So at the upper part of the humerus, uh, we should get an image that looks something like this, where we see a uh, ovoid uh, uniform biceps tendon positioned symmetrically within uh, the biceps groove. Moving slightly cephalab, we're going to start angling our probe in the expected course of the biceps tendon. Uh, and at the upper margin of the biceps groove, we should see this appearance where we've got the biceps tendon position at the lateral margin of the lesser tuberosity, uh, and indeed we also see some of the peripheral fibers of the subscapularis. Now again, at this point, to get your bearings, I'll just show you a representative MR image, and you'll be stricken by how similar these things are. Here's an axial uh, fat suppressed T2-weighted MR showing the biceps tendon in a similar position, uh, and here we've got uh, uh, some subscapularis tendon tissue, albeit somewhat more redundant as the patient is internally rotated uh, on that image. Uh, moving our probe slightly more cephalad and again obliquing a little bit more in plane with our expected course of the biceps, we can start to see some of that uh, peripheral rotator interval biceps tissue. 
Here you can see the biceps tendon free of its osseous margins of the biceps groove. Uh, and indeed, you've got some of the peripheral fibers of the subscap uh, here in yellow. There are your peripheral fibers of the supraspinatus. And indeed, in blue, uh, hopefully that projects well, you can see some of those fibers of the uh, transverse humeral ligament really making up fibers of the uh, subscapularis and also uh, coracohumeral ligament. Uh, in yellow, there's overlying deltoid tissue, and then there's your decompressed subacromial subdeltoid bursa. All right, so let's from there move into the rotator cuff. And the first tendon we're going to spend our attention looking at is the subscapularis tendon. Uh, you'll find uh, that imaging the subscapularis is best performed with the patient's arm externally rotated. Okay, and this makes sense. The subscapularis attaches onto an anteromedial structure, the lesser tuberosity. And so in order to expose the majority of the subscap tendon, you like to have your patient externally rotated. Now, uh, realistically, real-time imaging, you might, uh, you're doing this dynamically, and so some internal and external rotation is often useful, uh, depending on how much you want to profile the lesser tuberosity itself. Your marker for imaging the subscapularis is going to be the coracoid process. Okay, so we're going to take the probe uh, and position it roughly horizontal in orientation. Okay, bear in mind that the subscapularis does have a bit of a caudal to cranial orientation as it extends peripherally. So you might need to angle your probe, but I think if you start here, you'll get a pretty good image. Uh, the result of the sonographic image looks something like this, where in red you see the shadowing coracoid process. Uh, the, uh, the green line represents the articular surface of the humeral head, and in yellow, uh, the foot plate for the subscapularis tendon at the lesser tuberosity. And then there I've included in red both some of the bursal tissue, but also the fibers of the subscapularis tendon there. Uh, uh, here's another long axis view, and just to give you a representative MR, it looks uh, quite analogous where you see the subscapularis tendon interposed between coracoid uh, and uh, articular surface of the humeral head. Now, one of the things I think I want to bear in mind, and again, uh, I'm giving you representative images, but just recognize that the subscapularis tendon is shown on this fat suppressed T2 weighted image uh, has a broad foot plate. And again, uh, for some reason, this is not extending. Uh, uh, superiorly uh, enough. But nonetheless, it just emphasizes that the subscapularis tendon has a cranial caudal uh, dimension, around two centimeters from top to bottom at its footprint. So real time, you're sweeping your probe cranially and caudally to make sure you cover the entirety of that subscapularis tendon. Okay, And here, just for an example, these are some uh, more inferior insertional fibers of the subscapularis obtained in short axis. So to obtain, I'm, I'm sorry, in long axis, to obtain our short axis imaging of the subscap, we're going to rotate our probe 90 degrees uh, to our former orientation. We should get an image that looks something like this at the level uh, of the humeral head just beyond the myotendinous junction where you see relatively smooth and symmetric subscapularis tendon uh, tissue position over the humeral head. Uh, we're going to sweep our probe peripherally to make sure we're seeing the entirety of that tendon out to its bursal sided insertional fibers. Uh, and at the foot plate, we should get an image that looks something like this. Okay, where here you see subscapularis tendon tissue uh, attaching onto its footprint at the lesser tuberosity. Now, uh, um, often if my technologist fails to label these, it can be challenging to tell the difference between short and long axis imaging. Okay, and so uh, um, obviously the images look quite similar. Uh, if you're doing this real time, there will be no mistaking it. Just to show you uh, 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 an example of how this can be made easier, if you rotate that sonographic image 90 degrees, analogous to a sagittal MR image, you'll see how similar uh, uh, the subscapularis tendon appears on both of those images. So again, if it's uh, uh, helpful to you, rotate your short axis views uh, 90 degrees and become a little bit easier to see. All right, so moving into the supraspinatus, we're going to have to get a little bit more uh, creative with our, uh, with our shoulder positioning, and I think that this MR image will show you why. Uh, you can see that the osseous components of the coracoacromial arch, largely the acromion and clavicle, uh, obscure the majority of our supraspinatus tendon. I'm exaggerating the, uh, the extent of the supraspinatus, but nonetheless, I think you see my point. In order to image the supraspinatus well, then, we also need to add some anterior rotation to the humeral head to expose uh, those tendon fibers to an anterior acoustic window. Okay, and again, this would make intuitive sense, hopefully, to you. So uh, uh, pace, placing the patient's hand uh, on their back hip as if they're putting it into their jeans pocket is a useful uh, position to begin uh, to provide some anterior rotation of the humeral head and expose the supraspinatus tendon tissue anteriorly. Uh, this image is showing another uh, uh, way we can expose supraspinatus tendon tissue, placing the patient's arm behind their back. In addition to providing some anterior rotation, this position also provides some internal rotation. Uh, this line art drawing taken from a recent uh, European Skeletal Society uh, article that was published on uh, shoulder ultrasonography just demonstrates the effect that that has. It positions those supraspinatus tendon fibers at uh, its foot plate more anteriorly. And depending on your patient, uh, this may allow imaging those fibers to advantage.
So to obtain imaging, uh, important to recognize that probe position, uh, much as with the biceps, you want to use the orientation of your hum humeral shaft as a guide. Okay, so here for long axis views, that probe should be pointed down the shaft of the humerus. Okay, if you're oblique to the humeral shaft, you're often going to be obliquely oriented to supraspinatus tendon fibers, uh, which can uh, uh, cause some challenges for you in interpretation. All right, and your short axis images correspondingly will be uh, perpendicular to the long axis of the humeral shaft. So again, with the probe pointing down the shaft of the humerus, you're going to sweep forward until you identify biceps tendon tissue. Okay, so here you see some biceps tendon tissue in the peripheral rotator interval. The reason it's useful to do this is you should recognize that the subscap or um, supraspinatus rather uh, extends immediately adjacent to the biceps tendon if it's normal, right? So the next slice posterior to this that we obtain will be in supraspinatus tendon tissue. So as we sweep posteriorly, we make it a series of images. Uh, oh, also reminding you that as much as possible you are trying to image that tendon all the way from myotendinous junction to insertion. So you may have to do a little medial lateral positioning of your probe as well. So here is a large field of view images of, uh, obtained anteriorly. You can see a little bit of the coracoid process here. Uh, this is not the best image. I'll show you some better here in a moment. But here you can see a longer segment of that supraspinatus tendon uh, inserting onto its foot plate. And in keeping with uh, uh, previous images, you can see some articular cartilage shown in green. We're going to come back to the line in yellow that I've drawn, the orientation of the footprint or the supraspinatus is characteristic in its morphology. Okay, so I should, by the end of this lecture, be able to show you a variety of images only showing a non-labeled rotator cuff, and by the appearance of that footprint, you should be able to tell me what tendon we're in. All right, and this will become clear again by the end. Uh, so here is a more narrow field of view of the anterior fibers of the supraspinatus tendon, and it's very similar uh, to the image of tendons that, uh, that John Berry demonstrated to us. So hypoechoic zones demonstrated in the tendon, which are slightly uh, um, uh, obliquely oriented to our ultrasound beam, are hypoechoic. Uh, here you see some uh, uh, additional decreased echogenicity of insertional fibers. How do I know that that's anisotropy? Well, in, in this case, my technologist didn't mention that they were diseased. Real time, if you're doing the exam, you're going to know it's anisotropy by rocking your probe, right, doing a little heel-to-toe maneuver with some forward pressure. You have to have some forearm muscles to do this, right? Uh, but you're going to make sure that that disappears. Okay? If it doesn't disappear, you may have some tendinosis, although I would be hesitant to call tendinosis if that tendon is not thick. Okay, so remember that tendinosis typically implies you've got some tendon thickening as well. But nonetheless, this is a normal appearance for a supraspinatus tendon, and recognize its foot plate or its footprint. Okay, it's real, very characteristic. It's horizontal and relatively shelf-like. All right, and this will change, you'll see, as we move to the posterior uh, insertional fibers of the supraspinatus and into the infraspinatus. So in green, you see some of the articular surface of the humeral head. Okay, so here a slightly more posterior view of the supraspinatus tendon, and just recognize already the morphology of that foot plate is beginning to change. Okay, it's starting to round out and become more broad in its morphology. You, know, you should recognize you can't possibly be in the anterior fibers of the supraspinatus. All right, this will become clear as we move through the talk uh, further. Uh, in green, you see some of that characteristic fibular appearance of the articular cartilage at the humeral head. So uh, recognize that as we image the posterior fibers of the supraspinatus, we get into uh, a junctional zone, okay, uh, referred to by technologists as the overlap region, where we see altered fiber orientation between supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. So this is something that if you look at MRI, uh, you recognize. I think it's seen to advantage on ultrasound. So uh, this is what I mean. In long axis, the posterior fibers of the supraspinatus tendon, here recognize in green that the footprint is distinct from that that we saw in the anterior supraspinatus. It is broad and rounded, uh, therefore letting you know you're at least within the posterior fibers of the supra. Here you see uh, an obliquely oriented bundle of tendon tissue uh, deep to a more linear orientation of tendon tissue. Okay, So those red fibers are undercutting, uh, those supraspinatus tendon fibers that are undercutting the overlying infraspinatus tendon uh, at the uh, level of the conjoined tendon. Okay, it goes, has a lot of names, but just recognize that we expect to see this. Notice that the overall thickness of both bundles is equivalent to that that we saw in the supraspinatus. Okay, so that does not disease, that's just normal appearance uh, of the overlap. To obtain short axis images, we're going to rotate our probe 90 degrees to our position for long axis. So again, bear in mind you're perpendicular to the shaft of the humerus. Okay, always look down, look where your humerus is, and make sure your uh, probe is positioned uh, according to its orientation. So here's a representative large field of view, short axis image. You can see some of the biceps tendon tissue anteriorly. And then here is components of both supraspinatus and infraspinatus in this image. But again, even in short axis, recognize that supraspinatus tends to be a more proud structure, almost shelf-like and horizontal. You start getting this rounded, oblique uh, uh, morphology, a distinct change right here. And that indicates uh, the transition between supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendon. Now, we're a little bit obliquely oriented uh, in this particular image, but here you can see some of the uh, supraspinatus and more hypoechoic infraspinatus tendon tissue, largely due to anisotropy, and I'll show you a much better image of the overlap here in a moment. 
Uh, but perhaps this is the most important image. Remember that real time, what we're doing, we are sweeping peripherally, right? We want to make sure that you're seeing all of those tendon fibers all the way out to the bursal side uh, of its insertion. Uh, and at that image, it again emphasizes the very characteristic difference in morphology of the supraspinatus tendon foot plate, also in short axis, much the same as we saw in long axis imaging. I hear that more rounded, uh, obliquely oriented, and broad footprint, footprint for the uh, infraspinatus. And here you see those, those peripheral bursal surface tissues of the supra, and then at the overlap, the infraspinatus tendon tissue uh, immediately adjacent. Okay, so recognize your footprints. Uh, this actually made me a better MRI interpreter uh, in many ways. So to obtain long axis imaging of the infraspinatus, uh, the, the patient position that I'm showing you here is probably not going to be your workhorse position for the infra. Remember, the infraspinatus is a posterior superior structure. My technologist routinely can image anterior fibers in the infraspinatus in this position, and I think to do it, you're probably going to have to have their arm behind the back to provide both anterior rotation and interrotation of the humerus. Your probe may need to be a little bit obliquely oriented relative to the humerus. Remember that infraspinatus tendon fibers uh, traverse a bit from posterior to anterior here. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, those anterior fibers of the infra would look something like this, uh, where here you see the uh, that characteristic broad and rounded footprint distinct from the supraspinatus. Uh, and here are those insertional fibers uh, of the infraspinatus tendon. Uh, again, recognize zonal areas of decreased epigenicity representing an isotropy, which you're going to resolve real time by rocking your probe heel to toe. Uh, okay, there's also some overlying bursal uh, tissue in this case that's epigenic. Uh, having a patient positioned uh, uh, thusly is probably going to be a workhorse position for the infraspinatus again. Okay, so having the person's arm either neutral or slightly extended forward. Uh, will allow us to image those posterior superior uh, infraspinatus tendon fibers. Okay, this is not my image obtained from that same European Skeletal Society article. Uh, but in this view, it allows imaging of that infraspinatus tendon to advantage. And here on this uh, larger field of view image, you can see uh, almost the entirety of that tendon from its myotendon injunction out to its uh, insertion. Again, recognize the characteristic foot plate of the uh, infraspinatus. It's more broad uh, and round. So, um, again, you're going to probably use the person's arm neutral, slightly forward, ex uh, forward extension uh, with posterior imaging to image the infraspinatus, but you can get some sh short axis views uh, with the patient's arm in a position useful for the supraspinatus. Uh, so, shown here are short axis views by, uh, we obtained by rotating our probe 90 degrees, and we should get some images that look something like this. Uh, again, recognize the characteristic footprint of the supraspinatus, horizontal, prominent, shelf-like, versus that sloped, broad, you know, whatever, lots of words, but recognize there's a characteristic change in morphology. And this shows the overlap to advantage, by the way. So here's a short axis view of those insertional fibers of the supra. And then here you can see clearly uh, the infraspinatus tendon fibers as they pass over the supra uh, in the region of the conjoined tendon. So uh, moving on to another important point of the examination, much the same as you would with MRI, one of the things that's useful for, uh, uh, for your orthopedic surgeons is to note how uh, atrophied uh, tendon tissue is uh, if there is a tear. So certainly uh, this affects the ability to repair uh, a torn tendon uh, if there is severe atrophy present. So our marker for identifying muscle morphology uh, for the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor will include the scapular spine. Okay, This is something in most patients that should be easily palpable. Just to show you a representative long axis view of the supraspinatus, if we pair, uh, or place our probe Parallel to the scapular spine, uh, we should be immediately over the supraspinatus fossa and get an image that looks something like this, where you see characteristic uh, uh, muscle architecture of the supraspinatus, which typically is hypoechoic tissue with alternating bands of increased echogenicity representing fascial elements uh, and so on. But this is the normal appearance uh, of the supraspinatus at that level. And here you see some overlying fibers likely consisting of either trapezius or posterior deltoid, likely trapezius in uh, uh, that position. So just some representative short axis views of infraspinatus and teres minor, we're merely going to move our probe uh, inferior to the scapular spine. Okay? And I'm not showing you long axis for the sake of time, but I think short axis emphasizes, uh, and this image is rotated 90 degrees, but at the scapular body posteriorly, there are characteristic fossae uh, for the infraspinatus and teres minor. I think short axis imaging also gives you uh, comparative views of both muscle groups, making it easier to see if one of those two muscles were atrophied. Uh, in blue, there are some overlying posterior deltoid tissue and uh, some subcutaneous fat. So recognize that uh, we can, if attention is given to the posterior joint, see the labrum uh, and see it quite well. In fact, uh, uh, that, that's something that will take you some time if you're doing it real time. My technologist is quite adept at showing the images of the posterior labrum. In fact, uh, she keeps calling tears, and often I have to take her word for it, but sometimes they're uh, they're uh, they're very evident. So here, recognize uh, if we get a long axis image of the posterior glenohumeral joint. Okay, so recognize in white, you can see the echogenic surfaces of the humeral head and posterior glenoid. You can see a triangular hypoechoic structure uh, uh, that can represent nothing other than the posterior glenoid labrum. 
Uh, and again, real time uh, in a thin patient, this actually be easier uh, than I'm showing you here. It's a little bit tough to see on static grayscale images, but nonetheless, I think you can see it there. And certainly recognize that even though you may be challenged in finding the labrum, if there's a large paralabral cyst as a secondary finding for a label tear, you're going to see it back here. I don't think uh, uh, there'll be much challenge there. So let's move on to the uh, the end of the talk with uh, some pathologic cases. And uh, it's not often that we get cases in rapid succession where there is an ultrasound done and then an MR. I think most of our orthopedic surgeons uh, trust uh, MR. We do have a couple of young guys that train with uh, uh, with MR. And I think before they go in and operate, they like to have the, uh, the MR uh, in addition. But what it's done for me is to show uh, the power of ultrasound and, in fact, that uh, it's better in many ways than MR. Uh, here's just, uh, and again, this is all the same patient. Uh, in this case, we had a number of abnormalities. Our short axis imaging of the upper biceps groove shows an empty uh, biceps groove. Again, this would be uh, more evident on real-time imaging. A little bit of echogenic tissue you're seeing there uh, represents some capsular tissue. Just recognize that that normal appearance of the biceps tendon I showed you early on is not present. Again, real-time, this is much more evident. Here's the corresponding axial MR image where, again, you see absence uh, of biceps tendon tissue. This biceps tendon was chronically torn and retracted. So our long axis views of the uh, subscapularis tendon, so you can see perhaps a little bit of corpal brachialis here, the hypochoic muscular, uh, muscular tissue, but between the calipers, my technologist is just demonstrating there is no subscapularis tendon tissue. Okay, so recognize that the echogenic tissue we're seeing, which goes beyond the footprint, okay, of the uh, subscapularis at the lesser tuberosity, is a combination of capsule and, un and deep uh, fascial tissue of the deltoid. Okay, none of that attaches onto the lesser tuberosity. So effectively, there is no subscapularis tendon tissue. Again, that echogenic tissue is uh, some residual capsule. Uh, this is also shown on the axial MR, where again, you have some, uh, some capsular tissue, but no identifiable subscapularis tendon tissue. Uh, if we turn our attention to short axis views, you'll again see articular surface of humeral head in the first image and some of the footprint for the subscap in the second image. Recognize that in yellow, the undersurface fascia, the deep fascia of the deltoid, okay, but no subscapularis tendon tissue attaching onto the uh, 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 lesser tuberosity. Here is a uh, sagittal MR image which demonstrates a severely atrophied subscapularis tendon tissue in a more peripheral image which shows a bare uh, humeral head there, only some overlying capsular tissue. Uh, uh, again, verifying that we had a full thickness and retracted uh, subscapularis tendon tear. Perhaps more interesting is this example where I felt that we improved on the sensitivity of MR. Here is a short axis image of the peripheral uh, uh, rotator cuff. Again, recognize the characteristic change in morphology of the infraspinatus tendon footplate and the supraspinatus tendon footplate. And here we clearly see an undersurface defect of those posterior fibers uh, of the supraspinatus tendon in this case. A more peripheral image demonstrating the same. Here's the infraspinatus tendon footplate, supraspinatus footplate. Again, an undersurface defect. This became more evident on long axis imaging uh, at the region of the overlap, where here are some of those infraspinatus tendon fibers positioned immediately over uh, the uh, posterior fibers of the supraspinatus. Uh, so the, the, the tear is evident. I think these long axis images demonstrate some integrity of the peripheral dorsal sided tissue of the supraspinatus, but also clearly demonstrated the presence of fluid extending from the joint uh, into the tear. This can sometimes be useful, and I'll show you in this very patient on the MR, it can be challenging to identify if some of those articular surface fibers are still present or not, because ultrasound is very sensitive to fluid and to motion as you're doing this uh, real time. The fluid extending from the joint uh, into the tear indicates that there is disruption of articular surface fibers. So here, uh, another long axis view of the same, showing that overlap. There's the uh, uh, supraspinatus tendon fibers. You see the defect, and again, fluid freely communicates uh, via a, uh, a complete disruption of the articular sided fibers. So here is this tear on MR. Uh, here is our uh, sagittal MR uh, imaging, and you can see the footprint of the supraspinatus, and there the infraspinatus, and right where we expect it to be, we see the tear, uh, a rim rent type morphology tear of the posterior fibers of the supraspinatus tendon. On long axis imaging, we see the same, but again, recognize that I think you might be hard pressed. Uh, uh, to distinguish disruption of the articular sided fibers here. It almost looks like there's a little bundle of fibers that are hanging on for dear life at the central fiber uh, or central footplate of the supraspinatus tendon. And ultrasound actually improved our ability to depict uh, complete disruption there. Did that matter for the patient? Well, probably not. But, uh, but still, I think ultrasound was actually easier to interpret uh, in that case. Recognize uh, we have a means to improve our sensitivity for particularly full thickness tears. Uh, don't forget dynamics. We can scan the shoulder with resisted abduction. So we place our hand at the patient's elbow in, the, in roughly the position of the blue arrow there and have them gently abduct while we're imaging the rotator cuff. Right, if there's a full thickness cuff tear, you're going to see retraction because you're increasing the tone uh, of those uh, rotator cuff tendon tissue.
So just moving into other relevant pathology that you're likely to find, clearly the acromia clavicular joint is commonly diseased. Some of the things you're likely to find uh, are marginal osteophytes, as you see here at the peripheral margin of the acromion. Uh, on the right, compared to the left, you also see some heterogeneity and thickening of the uh, acromia clavicular joint capsule. This particular case became more interesting uh, when we imaged dynamically. So the two paired images uh, on the top there uh, show uh, irregularity in the margins of the acromia clavicular joint and also slight asymmetric widening compared to the left. But when we imaged dynamically, you can see that there was further widening of the right acromia clavicular joint compared to the left, which maintained a symmetric orientation compared to its neutral view above, uh, indicating that there was some mild instability at that joint. Um, certainly, the biceps tendon tissue is commonly uh, diseased as well. Here's another example of a torn retracted biceps tendon. Obviously, real time, if you don't see biceps tendon tissue here, you want to find it. Uh, here it is at the level of the upper humerus, uh, retracted with some abnormal tenosynovial joint fluid. Uh, the thickening, of course, is part and parcel with its retraction. In that same patient, we also found, similar to the previous case, uh, perhaps uh, there is some subscap tissue here on the long axis view of the subscapularis. But essentially, between the calipers denoted by the technologist, there really was no identifiable subscant tendon tissue. On our short axis view, I want to emphasize that the echogenic tissue you're looking at does not ever insert onto the foot plate. Okay, that's just the deep fascia of the deltoid. Okay, don't mistake that for rotator cuff tissue. In this case, deep to it, where we should be seeing subscapularis attaching onto its footprint, there is none. Okay, so this is a full thickness tear of the uh, subscapularis. Here's an example of a subluxated biceps tendon with some partial tearing uh, at the peripheral margin of the lesser tuberosity. Again, remember dynamics on real-time imaging in a little internal and external rotation, particularly internal rotation, will often stress these fibers. And if it wasn't subluxated on neutral with a little internal rotation, you'll often see it pop over uh, uh, the outer margin of that lesser tuberosity in this case. And certainly in the same patient here, you'd expect to find some abnormal tenosynovial uh, fluid uh, in the sheath of that tendon. Here's an example of a long axis uh, uh, view of the uh, biceps tendon demonstrating some uh, asymmetric thickening of its peripheral intraarticular segment. Again, much as with the Achilles tendon, recognize, and this is also true in MR, by the way, that tendinosis is diagnosed by a thick tendon even with normal signal intensity or architecture. Okay, Too thick is indicative of mild tendinosis, and in this case, that biceps tendon there is uh, asymmetrically thick and compatible with tendinosis. In the same patient, uh, again, albeit challenging, uh, this interarticular bicep tendon tissue is just a little bit too fat. Okay, So uh, in that same patient, tendinosis of the interarticular segment as well. Here's just an example of a full thickness tear. Here in short axis, you can see it already at the myotendinous junction, or just beyond it, rather. Uh, we've got abnormal attenuation of those posterior fibers of the supraspinatus. Okay, so we expect to find uh, worse disease peripherally, and sure enough, as we scan peripherally, we see that there's a sizable defect uh, in uh, that supraspinatus tendon. Uh, recognize, again, undersurface uh, tissue of the deltoid, that fascial interface of the deltoid is echogenic. Okay, but that's not rotator cuff tendon tissue. So here's a more peripheral image out of those bursal insertional fibers. Again, recognize the red arrows are pointing to the deep fascia of the deltoid. Between the two calipers, there is no identifiable rotator cuff tendon tissue. Okay, so we've identified a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon. Here on long axis images, the two red arrows point to the margins, the central and the, post and the peripheral margin of the footprint of the supraspinatus. Okay, so we should be seeing supraspinatus tendon tissue from here all the way to here. And recognize that you've got that echogenic undersurface fascia of the deltoid, but no supraspinatus tendon tissue at all. Uh, uh, where we should be seeing it. Okay, so a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus. Certainly some various examples of tendinosis, as I've emphasized, uh, we should be seeing a tendon that is, that is too thick, recognize that as being a markedly thickened tendon, and the hypoechoic regions that I'm demonstrating to you uh, did not resolve right, on real-time imaging. Therefore, that area of decreased echogenicity represents tendinosis and not an, an isotropy in this case. Here's another example of an infraspinatus that's just too thick. Uh, although more subtle in this case, this infraspinatus tendon was too thick, and again, uh, areas of decreased echogenicity, in this case within tendon fibers that should be positioned perpendicular to ultrasound beams, did not resolve uh, with dynamic manipulation of our probe, i.e. tendinosis, okay, not an isotropy. Certainly, ultrasound is exquisite for identifying fluid. Our ability to detect bursal fluid uh, is great. In this particular case, you can see some abnormal fluid in the anterior most portions of the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, likely uh, the subcoracoid bursa at this location. Uh, but nonetheless, this person uh, had a bursitis. Uh, here are some examples of atrophy in the expected locations of the infraspinatus and supraspinatus fossae. We don't see that normal muscle architecture. In fact, these two images look more like hepatic tissue, if anything, uh, very uh, coarse in echo texture and increase in echogenicity. And if you look closely, you can see some asymmetric uh, bundles of tissue that are even more echogenic. Okay? And those represent your severely atrophied infra and supraspinatus muscular tissue with some adjacent peritendinous fat. Now, again, that this finding would be useful for your orthopedic surgeon to know about. 
Um, certainly calcific tendonitis is something that we see well on ultrasound. Uh, it doesn't always shadow, but often does here in short axis within the anterior fibers of the supraspinatus. You see a, uh, a large globular region of shadowing uh, 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 material of increased echogenicity representing calcium hydroxyapatite. Here a long uh, longitudinal segment of calcification that doesn't shadow as much. And then here again another view of uh, uh, increased echogenicity foci within the fibers of the supraspinatus. So in conclusion, we kind of had a whirlwind tour uh, of shoulder ultrasonography where we've, uh, or I've attempted to stress the relevance of the examination and also spent a lot of time of uh, looking at technique, how to perform the study with attention to normal anatomy and some relevant pathology. So I hope that was elucidative to you uh, and thank you for your time.